you cannot continue to generate strong economies in today's era um, by getting people to just churn out hours at any cost. Those days are over. Okay, good afternoon everyone. We are here today with Dr. Jack Greinler from the Centre for Human Health and Performance. Jack, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Um, there's a lot for us to cover here, um, and we want to talk specifically about health optimization and that, and specific to entrepreneurs. But before we get there, it might be helpful if you could tell us how, how you came to be an expert at this intersection between healthcare, technology, um, and the other one that I can't remember. And entrepreneurship. <laughs> sure thing. So I've, oh, I've been a physician now, I think, for oh, August the 4th. It will be 21 years. Um, so practicing um, physician for that long and a professional geek for about 30 years. So, yeah, how old am I now? 45. So, yeah, age 15. Um, before before the thing, things like the web and so on were really a big deal. Um, been involved in developing human computer interfaces and I b basically paid my way through medical school doing all sorts of good stuff for uh, uh, people like Douglas Adams when he was still with us on planet Earth um, helping him design what the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy actually would be when it manifested itself uh, on the web um, so lots of good stuff lots of good experience uh, from a very from a very early age before the web really came into being uh, in, in the way it is now and um, kind of realized, especially after working with Douglas, actually, uh, that medicine was going to change really radically. That the kinds of books and libraries that I used to um, live in were not going to be where we would find the canon of medical truth. Uh, that actually, in the spirit of things like Wikipedia and the web in general and the Hitchhiker's Guide, that the world would the world would tap into knowledge that all of us would contribute to and that science would become more open um, if you needed to get an opinion you'd be able to get an opinion from goodness knows how many people pretty well instantly and all of these things were very nascent nebulous potential ideas they hadn't realized um, or manifested themselves yet but it was there it was there to become real and I realized that really if I were was going to project myself into the future of what a physician would look like that actually it was going to be someone who was a user of technology rather than a user of a stethoscope uh, or at least not a stethoscope alone and so I started uh, my first venture back company whilst I was still a junior doctor saving lives or maybe not saving them that well <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a first year uh, doc in, in uh, the Whittington Hospital um, A&E department um, and that company really helped me realize what being an entrepreneur was uh, also I might add this is like in 1999 2000 where mm. if you did that kind of stuff as a doctor it was you know really bad news they were kind of you know your, your 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 seniors would say what on earth are you doing <laughs> Jack you know we've we've spent all this money on you becoming a doctor and now you're wasting it on this computer stuff <laughs> and uh, and you know it was it was tough there were there weren't such things as the clinical entrepreneurship program which is run by professor Tony Young who I was actually at medical school with he used to beat me at squash the whole time but, um, <laughs> Uh, there wasn't the support, there wasn't the entrepreneurship programs, there was no such thing as Founders Factory, no such thing as Entrepreneurs First, there was a very, very uh, weak, if, if not, there was zero venture capital, really, for the kind of things that we were doing. Doctors were not regarded as entrepreneurs, they were regarded as people that should be there with stethoscopes in mm. white coats, and so uh, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, but it was an amazing journey, and uh, that company grew, and eventually it sold to Cigna, uh, which is a big health insurance company. And along the way, um, I started another few ideas in the uh, health tech space, uh, which um, did well. Um, little little projects that sold to bigger companies, and they themselves grew, built the tech, built the team, um, went on to the next thing. So 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 no no big unicorn, but but a real kind of understanding of what people needed, building things rapidly, which 
later became known as agile methodologies and so mm. forth and um, ended up you know re- really becoming quite experienced uh, in, in what it is to be an entrepreneur as as well as what it is like to be a doctor um, and so in 2007 um, the winnings went into my institute the CHHP uh, the Centre for Health and Human Performance which uh, is just just up the road there in Marlebone in um, the famous old Harley Strasse uh, mm-hmm. which is full of um, well, it's changed a lot actually. It's actually quite an incredible place now. But when I when I when I opened up um, the centre there, uh, it it was still very much regarded as a place of where you went to get expensive medicine or, or, or boob jobs or things like that. It it wasn't really regarded in in the light which it is today. It is a centre of real sort of excellence and a place to find even multidisciplinary groups that that are really at the cutting edge of medicine but the the reason we the reason we went there was because there was a there was a building that was empty and we thought okay that'd be a good place to actually do something medical and uh, we built a team now over the years of 40 or so scientists and specialists in health and human performance science sports medicine um and uh, the thing which i've specialized in, in in medicine which is the um uh, austere environments and extreme environments medicine uh, specifically high altitude physiology so if you want to climb Everest you come and see somebody like me um, so so that's that, that's the area of medicine that, that, that I'm personally interested in and uh, my group uh, work with elite athletes lots of people you know people who punch other people for a living yeah. and, uh, people who row across the Atlantic solo and people who do crazy things for comic relief and sport relief and all of that kind of stuff um, that, that that sort of elite athletic end of the spectrum is is the obvious bit that we do but we also see two other groups of people um one which we're very well known for in terms of research which is for cancer so it turns out if you treat cancer patients like athletes they do better they do a lot better and we actually understand not just why it is that they survive surgery but actually at a cellular level why fitness um, stops cancer from doing its job Mm. um uh, so, so that's a very interesting thing that we've seen evolve over the last decade is that fitness is really good for you, but we didn't realize how good it was hmm. for you. Uh, and then the bit in the middle uh, are the folk that are neither elite athletes from a physical perspective, nor are they super well, unwell, I mean, uh, with, with uh, cancer. Hmm. Um, but they're equally as stressed, <laughs> and they are founders. So we have, over the years, started working with brilliant entrepreneurs, uh, some of them who've gone on to become CEOs of very, very famous companies and, and so forth, and, and, and some of their teams, um, and we work with them because they, they too are athletes in their own, in their own right, uh, but they are non-physical athletes, and, and they are actually existing in stressful environments that, that are very akin to the kind of pressures that you are when you're, when you're being treated with chemo and radio and so on you are absolutely burning the candle at three ends which it turns out is really not good for you mm. and so kind of really deeply understanding the entrepreneurial mindset the pressures the stresses and what it takes to get people to do things beyond what the human body seemingly was designed to do to win gold medals or get through really tough disease situations is what we um, help give to entrepreneurs and founders uh, to help them thrive when they should break so there you go that's my story (laughs) and before we dive into exactly how you do that can you give us a little bit of insight as to why you got into the high altitude um what piqued your interest there i like skiing okay (laughs) it's very simple i like skiing i like climbing but presumably not skiing above the death zone that often no not that often no i i I love mountains i've always been there since very young and love mountains love medicine it seems fairly obvious that if you're going to do something you should try to combine the things which you do and you love and that's how it kind of ended up well and, and high altitude has become coupled with the idea of elite athletic performance whether it be boxers going to big bear in yeah. california or you know the mountains of kenya but it seems that there is something to high altitude training so um yeah um, so so th- that's another whole podcast i gotta say mm-hmm. uh, but we, you know there is a there is a whole debate around does let, let's take it one step back the, the physiology life gets better at doing what it does mm. if you can stress it and it has the capacity to adapt 
So your liver will function better with a little bit of alcohol stress. Your muscles will function better with a little bit of exercise stress. Um, in, in exactly the same way, um, it, your, the whole of your system will function better with a low oxygen stress. Mm. So that that's basically the principle of how it works. But it, there's there's subtleties to it, which is, do you, is it that you train at a high altitude or do you sleep at high altitude? You know, there's there's a whole load of there, there's a whole load of nuance to that. But and indeed, does it deliver a kind of metabolic efficiency based on the the starvation of resource of oxygen? That's it? that's essentially how all hormesis works. This sort of concept of a little bit of stress actually results in a better performing system, providing the system's young enough and can repair itself to adapt. Got you. So so if you stress yourself when you're too old, it will cause damage, and if you stress yourself when you're young, it will cause an improvement. So, yeah, that's and is that a continuous process over over life? So, um, I remember watching somebody have a heart attack at a gym uh, once upon a yonder, and mm. um, the story behind it was that he'd got back on a treadmill after twenty years in the insurance industry, decided to get fit and healthy again. Mm. But I think twenty years of damage had been done, and it was too much. It was too much for his system; his heart couldn't keep up. Um, would you advocate that somebody who had had a lifestyle of good health and fitness? where there's obviously a gradual decline, but essentially they've been fit and active, um, will be able to continue to benefit from those stresses versus somebody who's just trying to get fit again after a long... The, the, the longer that you maintain um, those stresses, those adaptive stresses, so uh, which result in better fitness, um, and by better fitness, I don't mean just running for a bus, I mean at a cellular level, your cells are mm. fitter. The, lo- the earlier you started and the longer you, the longer you continue, the longer it will last. It's, it's a dose response. So your, your body will soon forget um, how to be fit if you haven't done it for 20 years. Amazing. Um, yeah, and then if you try to do it again, your brain will say, well, this is probably what I'm capable of doing, and, but your body isn't. It, a, a very gradual return to, return to where you were would be required if you had a 20-year break from, from the gym. <laughs> and will those people who are used to certain kinds of stresses be better at adapting to new stresses? So if they switch between different sports, let's say it was a high-level boxer who then wanted to take up triathlons, would he just be much better at adapting to new situations or is he too ingrained into a certain body physiology? It's a very good question. I don't know. I, I, know, I, I know that there's a very big difference between psychological stresses and, physio- and physical ones, um, whether or not there's a, a crossover between, let's say, weightlifting and endurance running. I, um, I would suspect that there are some things that are in common, like mm. your heart would beat faster. So if you, mm. that, that, would, that would work. But there's a, it's a very there's a very big difference between lifting a weight and the and, and the mental uh, burden of training for that kind of thing versus let's say the isolation of of a solo transatlantic row, mm. which is becoming b- bigger questions as we as a species tackle um, you know potentially talking about commercial s- trips into space where I guess the psychological components the physio the physiological components of of traveling up out of our atmosphere are, are phenomenal. When you're talking about high altitude, mm. it's going to pose even bigger problems if we end up going to, to Mars or a place like mm. that. I feel like I'm digressing, so I'll pull it back I w- in. And I wanted to just digress quickly again. Yeah. So this the poor guy who fell up the aircraft, the stowaway, and landed in Clapham or somewhere, um, <laughs> there was some debate as to whether he was alive when the, the wheels opened at 3,500 feet and he fell. Yeah. Um, could he have survived at that? Actually, I think somebody from the BBC called me about that. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I think a, a, t- a long drop of three and a half thousand feet, you're probably at terminal velocity. I think it, it takes a lot <laughs> of luck to be alive when you hit the ground. Um, yeah, but uh, y- you'd have to be quite high up in the air uh, for you to be unconscious. Um, mm. But I mean, so he'd had an. If it was from Kenya, it was what, an eight-hour flight. Of course, actually, you're right. Yes, 000. he was. He was at the end of. So, so if it was, if it was not pressurized, it would be very, very unlikely for him to be able to survive. Okay. So only a few people who are very, very well conditioned can climb to the top of Everest right. without oxygen. So, but, like Wim Hof. Like Wim Hof. And um, Wim Hof's great with cold. I'm not entirely okay. sure, as sure if he's as good without oxygen. But you know, the likes of like Reinhold Messner, who famously. Um, uh, was the first person amongst the first people to climb to the top of Everest without oxygen. They are they have a very specific genotype, which is their ACE gene. They've got two insertions of the ACE gene, which makes them capable somehow of doing things without oxygen, well, with less oxygen than other people, and just bloody brilliant training. Mm. Um, so you know you can't just 
pop yourself up at the top of Everest and have a picnic for six hours. Mm. Uh, that it's it's uh, yeah. Well, anyway, there we go. But it's an, what you're trying to get at. I think overall is that you can push the body to extremes. You yeah. can push the mind to extremes, but you can't just do that overnight. And and but whether you're someone falling out of an airplane or being up in a in an airplane for for seven hours from Kenya, whether you're climbing Everest without oxygen, or frankly whether you're an entrepreneur working goodness knows how many hours and traveling um, and trying to keep your mind and your body in good shape, it actually requires some training, some practice. You can't just dive in there and expect mm. to stay healthy. Do you think so, that? Tr- sorry. So on the subject of human, was that sorry, was that apropos? the last thing we were discussing I think so go on then I was going to say do you think um, the, the the immersion in stress for entrepreneurs is what we colloquially call grit is this the kind of the people loosely saying you know toughen up and expose yourself to it and show some grit is actually this sort of exposure to medium levels of stress continually and, and persevering through it rather than seeing it as a problem unto itself you see it as a means of actually building you up mm. there's um yeah, there's there's a, there's a brilliant book that was written by somebody who is a colleague of mine called Professor Mike Stroud, who uh, was Ranulph Fiennes's expedition buddy and doctor on all of his trips. Um, he's a int- very fantastic writer and speaker, for that matter. And he talks about this sort of concept of grit. I don't know if he actually calls it grit, but it does actually it does actually come to a state of mind. Um, your your parts of your body parts of your brain sorry when your body is saying this is enough or parts of your mind are saying this is enough um they they just say right shut down finish you know run away from this and then there's other bits of your of your mind which say well no hang on we we we've got i i hear you i i know this isn't like normal and if and if this was the situation forever then i i I know it'd be very bad to carry on Mm. um uh, case in point Mike Stroud was with Ralph uh, Ralph um, uh, Fines on the Trans Antarctic trip that they did, and uh, you know M- M- Mike was explaining about how he would tell Ran um, that if he said to Ran that he was going to kill him in order to end the trip early <laughs> going back just to just to be okay and say you know like recognize that was just one part of his brain that mm-hmm. was like, he was conjuring up all sorts of horrid ways of ending the trip because you know your brain is telling you this is a tough journey this is a this is a tough funding round this is this is this is a tough last push for the summit this is a tough next hundred miles to go at minus 60 or, or whatever it is and then there's the other part of the brain I guess you want to call it the gritty part of the brain, which just says, no, I hear you, and there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There, There is a rational, irrational prize, but at the end of the day, it's not just going to carry on like this. And I think that kind of, for me, if you look at the commonalities between um, my patients, which are either entrepreneurs or elite athletes, uh, which include people who've crossed the Antarctic and climbed Everest and and people who I think are probably the most amazing minds um, are the people that really fight hard through and keep positive through all the treatment that they have with cancer they all have that sense of grit but but it's not just it's not it's not just something that some people have gotten other people don't we've all got it it's a case of some of us have have just got a, a sense of that voice saying I know this is tough but we're gonna push on mm. um, often though excessively and it does result in system failure and so you know being able to balance those two voices the, the, the voice of this is very silly let's stop and no we've got to carry on mm. um, and getting that right is something which we need to learn as entrepreneurs just as we learn as athletes mm. I think so on on the subject of human optimizing human performance I think it'd be clear, very clear to a lot of people why that's a thing for elite athletes but for you know everyday people you know entrepreneurs that, that is a you know a category of person um, and it's a, maybe it's a special one but ultimately they're just everyday people and it's not 
I don't think it's immediately obvious to everyone that optimizing performance is something that would apply in that scenario. Uh, I, I, I would I would say that um, I, I would say that the, the, the mind of an entrepreneur maybe has a, a higher level of risk tolerance automatically in, in terms of just <clears throat> happy to happy to take more risk and, and can visualize the reward at the end. I'm not necessarily saying financial reward, but the, you know, the, the ability to, to, to turn a, a thought into, into something that lots of other people are benefiting from or some kind of, uh, you know, uh, design into, into an touchable thing. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I think, one of the big differentiators of an entrepreneur. Another big differentiator of an entrepreneur um, is that they are pretty good or at least anyone that really is pushing themselves to succeed is that they're very very happy to uh, it, you know Im fail and, and like constantly sort of say well what happened you know not, not to ignore what happened but okay this was great some things didn't work why um, and actually realizing that the very the very best knowledge that you can ever have in order to learn how to succeed in really tough situations only comes from studying failure. Mm. Otherwise, it's just plain luck, and that actually runs out pretty fast. Mm. Um, and, and, and actually, that, I think, is kind of, if you think about a spectrum of people, um, people that are really okay with screwing up, learning rapidly, and trying again, um, and and learning, you know, how far to push it. Because if you push it too far, the next time and you completely collapse, you don't get another chance. So that that's something which I think is it's quite hard to teach or train people to do. They're kind of inherently born with some of that. They don't put it into practice, uh, but they've got a higher a, a lower risk aversion. So they've they've um, they're okay with risk, and they're prepared to fail and learn from it. Um, human performance science is entirely about that so if you just want to take the if you look at any athlete or any formula one team mm. um esports nowadays the the professional computer game players take it very seriously they all do the same you know they're all <laughs> willing to put their necks on the line uh, and 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 learn from failure repeatedly and that is um and th that's a common thread, I think. It's it's not a superpower, but it's certainly a characteristic of the entrepreneur, just as it is an athlete. You know, you 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 might also start thinking about well, an athlete also has to be unbelievably um, good about their training, about their physical activity. Yeah, fair enough. You don't actually have to be able to run a hundred meters in less than ten seconds to code brilliantly well or make a great deal if you're selling your company to Google, but um, you, you know, nutrition, for instance, um, is absolutely essential for cognitive function. So is physical activity. Very, very few people get away with their brains working unbelievably well if they are um, very sedentary. There are some extremely well-known examples of people who've lived their lives incapacitated in wheelchairs whose minds still work phenomenally well. Mm. Um, but in general, there is a very close correlation between how your body is functioning and how even things like uh, BDNF or growth hormones for the brain, it's, it's, it's released as a result of some of your big muscle groups firing. And then other things that, that athletes have to do, like sleep. I mean, you try running a business um, without sleeping. People do. A lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. But they don't do it nearly as well as if they get, if they get smart about their recovery. I was just watching um, a YouTube video with Ollie before this about Roger Federer saying he takes 12 hours of sleep a night and many other top level athletes yeah. because the, uh, for them, especially the, the basketball players, and NBA, NBA players, they've got such a grueling schedule that the injuries um, just add up and yeah. add up and add up if you can't so stop. How old is Roger? Like he, he, he looks young, but he's not, he's not young, yeah, is he? He's so, so, I mean, there are very, very few people that are performing at the very peak of their performance which he still is mm. at the age of 38 Unreal. how many how many entrepreneurs are you seeing that are still performing as well at the age of 38 but I it's mean, funny from a physical perspective mm. not a lot of them have been 
getting enough sleep. Why We Sleep, the book by Matt Walker, read it. It's an extreme. Th- you read that. I, I read it. I didn't sleep for weeks. You didn't sleep for weeks really, because you read the book so about why you should be sleeping. I was so stressed about it. It really, really frightened me. And so it should. Yeah. So I, I, agree, I completely agree. So I've taken up jiu-jitsu recently, and if I don't sleep at eight hours my joints will continue to yeah. hurt for the rest of the week if I get eight to nine hours then I find that not- they're notably mm-hmm. less painful as though there's been more time to just simply carry out maintenance yeah. mm-hmm. and repairs um, it's the there is only one reju- rejuvenation clinic in the world that you can visit every day and that's your bed mm. um, and it's the cheapest rejuvenation clinic in the world as well yeah. but uh, this is what's so funny about the whole entrepreneurial story that's been told for for the longest amount of time is that it was built on people who would be stuck in an office working round the clock who would not prioritize health and fitness um, and it seems a bit ridiculous now that that was the case that you know same, the, the, with, same with the you know traders and, and the stock markets it's same with same with companies that are like I don't know Accenture and the, the the big consultancies the it was better the metric of whether you are a good bod working in an organization <laughs> was that was not what you did uh, it was how much you were Time a, you appeared test. to be doing mm-hmm. uh, it was like a you got your stripes by um, you know by having big bags under your eyes and saying yeah I didn't sleep again third night in a row and everyone's going oh my god you know they work so hard they're so great and I was saying to be and I was doing the same well I was doing the same myself I wasn't proud of it you know for me it was like oh my god I actually know that I'm dying mm. Mm. Um, by doing this or at least accelerating the processes of of uh, mismatch repair um, and damage which accelerates aging and, and so on um, Brilliant, you know. If 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 it really is that our metric of success is to build a company um, at any cost, then fine. Go build your company faster than you should, at the cost of your own health, your relationships, and every single person that works in your organisation. And go be proud of that. And go be proud to make thirty x for your investors. Mm. Those days have gone. Mm-hmm. It is now absolutely essential that we understand that the most impactful companies in the world the fastest growing companies in the world attract talent where we at the very very core of founding the company look at wellness look at the the long tail of performance and I I, I really I'm really positive now that people have realized that you've got to take balance it's got to be the best companies are balanced Uh, they're, they're about the well-being of everybody versus just the well-being of the bank account for pushing it mm. further than you should mm. so I've got a question for you just to, to put out to listeners how able do you think somebody who puts in three to five years of 80 to 100 hour weeks and a bad lifestyle how able after the the exit comes do you think they are to, to return to any kind of decent health outcome I think you have to I think you have to ask those kinds of founders. I, I was the, the longest working week I ever did was when I was I think it was um, was I doing surgery or I can't remember one of the one of the rotations um, at the Whittington Hospital. Presumably that's the worst time to not be sleeping as well. Well, I was also had a startup. Bear in mind, so you know it was <clears throat> it was hundred and twenty hour weeks. Okay, now I, I look at that and I say to myself, in in a year I probably did three years of work. Mm. Um, which has interesting properties of both, you know, screwing up more than you should, um, but but also kind of learning, having to learn how to cope under pressure. But net net, that is wrong and bad, and that's why we have now limited doctors' hours to being more sensible. Um, you end up actually in the end maybe taking a bit longer to end up with a work a workforce. That, that has the same level of experience as people who've been working 120 hour weeks but you kill fewer people mm-hmm. and you end up with a happier group of you have a happier workforce mm. who themselves don't end up in with issues so you know all of these things are a balance they're all about um, economics of how much you take from a system versus how much you, you allow it to grow and repair I, I would say that I am probably one of the very very lucky people that used to do those hours 
and didn't end up in a psychological or psychiatric or physical breakdown. Mm. Uh, but I recognized it and I felt it and was able to sort of say, okay, this is this is not so good. I, I, I see now where my stomach is just not working properly and, you know, I'm bent over in two from pain and just not being a great partner and and so on um yeah but it depends what your priorities are i think i think times have changed as i say I don't it's like this it's exchange culture anymore. of when you have the energy and and the time but not the resources as a, as a young kid it's almost like people are trading against their their future value by saying i've got lots of energy in my 20s and therefore if i exchange it quickly and aggressively as you say with 120 hours in the promise of future riches and I think this is the game that goes on with entrepreneurship as we sort of talk about an athlete Roger Federer from 21 to 37 I think you speak to most entrepreneurs and ideally they want to be out in three to five years at which point they've bought their freedom and suddenly will figure out that they can buy relaxing holiday homes and stuff like this it it doesn't really work out that way and as you say I think anybody who's ambitious will go on to something afterwards but I think that's the story they tell themselves is it'll be okay I just need to get through this three years, five years. I'm out. I've sold my company. Yeah, that that's right. It's I've got the energy now. It is a trade off. It might knock three or four years off of my life, but I'll be rich enough to pay for better doctors mm. or, or something like that. Look, everything regresses towards the mean at the end of the day. But I don't think I don't think those are. Look, some some people just have the ability to run further and train harder, and some people don't. And and. Uh, entrepreneurs you know don't do normal nine to five working weeks they, if if we if we could do that it would be really great but it would make it very very easy to do startups and, mm. and because really what a startup is 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 motivating people to be who are as bright or brighter than you, more hardworking than you, more ethical than you, more creative than you, get them together around a common cause and get them to do more than they otherwise would if they were in a kind of a slow moving environment like, uh, I don't know, a big company, company mm. X, large company pays you lots mm. of money, but you know, there's no real major prize for, 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 for achieving the Manhattan project, mm -hmm. for instance. And at, at the end of the day, that extra amount of energy, passion, hard work, and so on, um, is, it, it, it's, it does pay off, it should pay off. Uh, at least it does pay off like what, every two out of 10 times, one out of 10 times, I don't know what the series A for, or startup uh, uh, ratios are um, of success, but y you do have to put in those extra hours, otherwise everyone would be doing it. That, that's the bottom line. I think it's all about balance and limits and knowing that your body is at a limit and stopping before it breaks or knowing that your team is being drawn into a black hole, a singularity of burnout, mm. it, those are the things that actually make your critical next meeting with an investor where you just have that moment of clarity and you just pause instead of jumping at the, you know, when you didn't like what that person said, the control over your facial muscles as a result of being calm that changes the atmosphere, a smile or a joke instead of a, instead of a, oh my God, you, you know, that's not what we agreed. You know, the, these magical moments are what turn the tables and change disaster into success. And that those are things that more regularly happen when you are when you've looked after yourself than when you're at the very edge of kind of adrenal exhaustion and you know you're knackered. Mm. <laughs> so um, yeah, I I don't know. Th these things are, are not black and white. There's there's a there's a spectrum of trade offs. I think we are now truly beginning to realise whether you're an athlete, whether you're a patient, or whether you're an entrepreneur, uh, that there are some things in the toolkit which probably mean that you aren't burning yourself out quite as much, but you're ending up net-net producing as much or more success than you were before. So how do you go about consulting entrepreneurs and optimising their performance and their well-being? And what state do they typically come to you in? Ah, well, so there's a range. There, there are some folk who, who really, uh, you know, kind of have broken themselves a bit. They've... They, they've not been as lucky physiologically or genetically. They, they may uh, metabolically not be so good, meaning that you know perhaps they've 
they're not able to burn calories as much as other people um they, they they're just like got a lot of life stress got a lot of work stress and have got into bad loops um of of not being able to switch off switching on without a kind of like a run-in period each morning uh, not really being present there with their families or their staff um you know too much context switching through to people that really are already pretty wise as to their health their fitness their wellness their mindfulness and so on so there's a spectrum uh, but irrespective of that and irrespective of whether you're an entrepreneur or, or an athlete or anything the first thing you ask people is you know kind of like who are you like tell us about you what do you mean like uh, where do i live no, no, no like what from nine months before you were born mm. like, like let me tell me about you and actually it's it's quite a cathartic, quite a quite a therapeutic process to actually go back and say, well, you know, I uh, yeah, I was born there. My parents were like this, and it was over there, and uh, this is what happened when I was a kid. And you know, you you go through that process as to where you've gotten to, and then you kind of ask the question, okay, like, and where do you want to go? Like, what really is the end game for you in twelve months time and in ten years time? And then you start asking questions about, okay, so tell me about your physical health. <laughs> tell me about your, your headspace. Tell me about your friends and family. Tell me about your, uh, your, your social support systems and so on. And you rapidly begin to break the ice. You realize that the person sitting in front of you is not just a bloke that wants to prescribe you with this, that, and the other, or say, oh, God, your blood pressure sounds like it's probably through the roof, or you need a scan. But actually, there's another human being sitting in front of you that, that has gone through this kind of stuff. And understands the world that you live in mm. so there's a there's there's an exchange of trust uh through vulnerability and through being open uh which is terribly important i think uh in any kind of uh, consult medical consultation if you want to call this a medical consult and uh then from there we start going into individual areas of the body such as you know your yeah your, your lungs have you have you ever smoked the you know, basic things like that um and uh you know how often do you get sick each each year and uh then we start digging into the juicy stuff which i really like which is like your sleep tell us about your sleep tell us about your nutrition and you you very rapidly understand that most people have never ever thought about it they they kind of think they've thought about it but they've never actually had it reviewed properly <laughs> And, and it's very illuminating because they end up real, you know, it's, it's the best possible scan or blood test or whatever it is you could possibly have is a good old fashioned history, mm. a proper history. It takes about an hour, an hour and a half. That's how you start. And then from there, uh, we, we look at family risk. So I ask, you know, about brothers, sisters, um, parents. Uh, when did they start getting ill? Are they, are, are they on any meds? Brother, uh, uncles, aunts, both sides, grandparents, great uncles, great aunts, great grandparents, genetic or, you know, like ethnic origin, where, where they actually, uh, where their roots are from. And, and you start to see pictures about, it, it's almost like um, a crystal ball. You can start to see from those patterns if someone can give a good family history. Obviously, you can't if you've been uh, if, if you've been adopted or or, or, or you, you you know your 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 genes are not your parents because of egg donation or things like that. But you can rapidly see the trends that are happening in the family. You don't have to do a genetic test to do it. You, you can see what are the kinds of things that might be affecting that person. So you look at where they came from from when before they were born to where they are now to the kinds of things you think that they want to do over the next 10 years and you map that across what it what's happened to all of their uh, relatives and soon you can get a very very good picture about where they're most likely to break uh. and where their greatest sort of inherent resiliences are some people can cope with a lot less sleep some people can cope with smoking and others are dropping dead of it in their family history and so forth and and then you you come up with a bunch of uh, maybe uh, you know assessments that you want to do in terms of measuring putting numbers around their fitness um, getting an aura ring or some other more formal sleep study system uh, seeing actually how it is that their sleep and recovery um, is, is, is performing um, how much stress they're actually under by measuring their heart rate heart rate variability and so on during the day um, and building up a picture of what you need to change and then that turns into what we would call a program and the program is exactly what you do if you're rehabbing an elite athlete at the Olympic Medical Institute we run it every three months you come up with a prescription of things to do things to take 
um, things to not do, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, prescription or otherwise, and um, you remeasure and you go through the cycle again. And quarter by quarter, you start creating a better system um, that is more resilient, feels better, and that your health insurance company probably likes more. <laughs> mm. Do you consider um, stress when it's overstressed to be, to a degree, faceless? Will you just see the elevation of cortisol levels breaking down cellular tissue? Or is there a very just clear distinction between somebody who's physically st- too stressed and, and mentally too stressed? I mean, can you, can you identify these things? With- yeah. I mean, there are lovely things that you can, you can look at heart rate and heart rate variability, for instance. You know, it, it will affect your blood pressure a lot of the time. It's, it's very rare to have a pure psychological stress without it showing up as a physiological stress. Mm. The big question is how long has that stress been there? Because it might have caused such a long-term effect on your body that you can't see it as a change anymore. It's right. become your baseline. So that's hard to spot. And it's only once you actually fix the, the causes of stress, which are not an overnight you know, thing to, to, to fix, that you'll see it, s- sometimes some quite dramatic changes in people's like baseline heart rate variability, blood pressure. Um, if, you, if you were to measure your cortisol in your saliva in the morning through or throughout the day and so on, you'd see a different picture, a much less stress picture. You might see uh, an increase in thing called DHEA that's a kind of a hormone that's a... Um, Kind of response as a res- it's a it's a it's a it's a hormone that re- that gets released in the res- as a response to stress um, that might change it. So so there's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of things that you would see in in the body, um, but also very frank things like if you're sleeping better as a result of having your head in a better place, mm. you will naturally produce more of those good things like we talked about when you said if you don't sleep now with your jujitsu, um, you don't feel your body repairing. Well, you'll see a difference in your creatinine kinase. It's another thing which shows it's about muscle breakdown. You might see um, various other factors like growth hormone or testosterone or free testosterone. Those levels will change if you've got better sleep. Um, so th- there are lots and lots of things, if you're a real geek about it, that you will that you can actually see in blood tests, uh, in physiological fitness tests, even in scans if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to go that far. What's very interesting with the with the joint pain is I'm acutely aware that if I took the approach of toughing it out and just turning up session on session, then those injuries will go from a day or two to three months. Because mm. you can feel that the warning signs are coming in, but if it was just going to go plow through, plow through, don't worry about it, just be, you know, strap it up, you're going to be, it's going to get 10 times worse. And And I guess the issue with workplace stress is, what is the role of the workplace to understand the employee such that they can step in at a time to stop uh, yeah, a couple of day issue becoming a three great month challenge? It's a real challenge because it's not as well. It used to be really cool to be stressed and tired. Yeah. Now at least we know that you'll have your head of HR looking at the people who are really burning the candle at three ends and. Th- they'll they'll start to have gentle words with people and not and sometimes not so gentle words you know they, they, they there is at least that awareness there there are tools which are and this is actually one of the things which we did in my first startup back in uh, back in 1999 2000 was just having questionnaires that people could answer which measured or estimated things like workload and life load and, and st- sleep deficit you can spot in advance the groups of people that are under too much pressure and you can actually predict when it is that they're going to crack but there's other great things like I, I don't want to particularly um, pick out certain brands but because of its fantastic form factor the aura ring has become something that you, mm. you, there's almost no entrepreneur that I've seen that doesn't good? have an, an aura ring what is, I was thinking, so, what is it? it's really what, oh, well yeah. it's it's a heart rate variability heart rate monitor but they've managed to squeeze five days of battery life into something the size of a ring and it's a very it's a relatively discreet ring but if you wear it at night uh, or if you wear it in the day but mainly for the night it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't damage it doesn't take up any real estate it doesn't damage your sleep in any in any way because it's so subtle and it 
just doesn't get in the way that you get like really reliably from people even who hate wearing monitoring devices you get great data and what we're finding is that um, working with Aura we, 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 uh, it's a Finnish company mm. and um, they never really thought about doing this in the short term but there's been such demand from it and as their sort of like clinical development uh, centre we said look you know as a doctor a performance physician, a performance team looking after entrepreneurs, what we want to see is the group of people who are all leading that company to be able to see the trends in in their sleep deficit or recovery or, or otherwise um, and to be able to tell them, hey, you're going to pop, which has never been possible before. Because it's really good at picking up on overtraining. Another, my friend's example of it was it would I think give some indication that today was a bad day to go to the gym because uh yeah I mean those der- those d- derivative sort of um advi- advice is great if you can't interpret the raw data but yeah. we can tell from how long it takes at night for your heart rate to drop to its very base so if you if it takes till 6 a.m. or whatever hours and hours and hours for your heart rate to drop down to f- 50, 48, whatever beats per minute, um, which should be, let's say, my baseline, but I never get there. Um, or, 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 or if my heart rate variability remains flat and low and doesn't like lift up, variability is really good. It suggests that you've got a nice balance between stress and relaxation, stress and relaxation in your cardiovascular system. You can see that very easily just by looking at the lines and just go, oh my God, these people are. Because you're correct. If it goes too low for too long, it suggests your your body's inability, to, unable to fire itself up correctly. Exactly, exactly. And then and then obviously these apps say we don't advise that you overdo it today, and that's great. But if, why why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because more and more tools out there are becoming affordable and practical. Uh, as wireless um, devices for us to be able to get the kinds of insights that we only got with elite football teams mm. who were wearing, let's say, the first beat thing, which actually was a, like an e- one lead ECG that went across your chest that you couldn't wear in the shower and all of those sorts of things. Um, and now that's shrinking into uh, a ring, which is five-day battery life. How does it take the measurements? Does, does it use um, like an infrared to read the computer? The capillary signals, right? I don't that. actually know. Okay, uh, it's some sort of photo, so, some sort of um, yeah, light-based uh, sense sensory array. But it does, yeah. yeah. Anyway, there's lots of these things, um, and 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 more and more of them are coming on the market. I'm absolutely no doubt that Apple will come up with with their alternatives and and so many other clones that that stuff will all kind of meld into sticky plasters or something that no one will ever even notice is on a person. Mm. I'm not worried about the form factors in future. It's just that if the, there is a whole lot more that we can do now for teams. It's not just about the individual, it's about being able to look at teams. Presumably the abuse of certain organisational cultures. Because if you picked up on teams from a certain company or having serious issues with diabetes, heart attacks, whatever it might be. It's, it's like the, the culture within this organization is fundamentally flawed yeah, and needs revision. Yeah, and, and actually one of the things which we've been talking about with a bunch of different um, folk is this sort of concept. A couple of years ago we, we came up with this fun little word uh, called, like a name for, for this project, called, we called it Well Founded, which is that your company should be founded on wellness. And so instead of just doing what we do for relatively... Um, yeah, well-resourced individuals is actually can we can we do the same sort of thing without having to come to our clinic uh, and sit in our lab to get measured? But you know, c- can your whole team do this as a startup very very affordably using tech instead of silly expensive people like me? Um, and, can you? And yeah, and it turns out you know it turns out there's a great deal of um, appetite from venture funds um, Mosaic the fund which I work for is really pushing it out there to be the first pioneer of this it's remarkable that actually a fund uh, who normally is is well, not no, not Mosaic but a lot of funds were well known in the past for really you know sort of encouraging that bad culture and, and pushing people too far at any cost uh, but but now pretty universally we're seeing that the funds the fund managers and the the investors in those funds all want their companies and themselves to all be living well 
first and foremost, absolutely on par in balance Paripasu with their companies. It's 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 actually I don't I don't want to use words like revolution, but it's certainly a very big change to what was around five years ago in terms of attitude. So I I, I feel pretty positive that um, the culture um, is changing and the tools for us to really optimize that culture um, are now emerging. So look ahead to when you, well, imagine that in five years time you, you decide to to put everything else aside and start another. You're asking, you're doing your own consult on me. Would you want to be little, in five years? Little, <laughs> little tech startup, what would that look like? If you, had a, you were building a team of you know, 20, 30 people, how would that look in terms of this technology and the, the healthcare going on around that? If I were to start my own, another startup of my own. Well, not necessarily, but how would you imagine like a, re- a well-founded? How would a well-founded yeah. company look? I would want something, first of all, in the term sheet from the VC saying, if you don't invest either both this amount of money and this amount of time and resource into founder, founding team and company wellness, um, which means performance and health as well, mm-hmm. we're not going to fund your company or X percent of our funding will will have to go for mm. that. So, and, and actually, people will want to go to their fu- those funds. Mm, you can mm. envision it, actually, where there's an ethical standard to a term sheet available. It's like, like it's B Corp. Yeah. Or, di- or, or, you know, you've got a diversity stamp. It's not, it's not just a stamp. It has to be lived, but you'll, be, you'll gravitate towards the brands which have been invested by the companies that have been invested by people that really want that to happen. Mm. So it comes from it comes from the board, it comes from the investors, it comes from the top. And then the founder themselves have to I don't really care whether you're actually wearing a an aura ring or wearing nothing at all. But that they really understand the basic tenets of recognizing um, when people are stretched. So this is very much about the awareness of training load and overload and what it takes to bring back the team into full performance through recovery. It so- I'm sounding like I'm making you know, sporting analogies, and I really am, yeah. because it really is like that. It's exactly like that in chemotherapy, knowing when the toxicities are getting too much. We know that if you pull back, people do better. We know when the toxicities of the environment, of the stress that you're working in, if you see it. Um, so understanding that, being ultra emotionally sensitive and aware to how what is going ex- on. How do you expect founders to to get to that point? I'd give them a reading list to begin with. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, some of the key some some of the key reading. Well, I think first of all I don't think as many founders today are ignorant of this stuff mm. as as we were when we were starting companies 20 years ago. So I, I think it's Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, does it does it really take a lot of training today to say that we that uh, to get somebody to be up on diversity? It's not a massive amount. It's still a lot of work to do. Mm. But diversity training is there. Um, there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't invest similar amounts of time on wellness. You know, before the company becomes 300 people in size. You, you you inject that understanding of the importance of sleep, movement, nutrition, um, recovery, and mental health um, at the very beginning, and you you get them to. It's almost. I mean, maybe maybe we could develop actually some kind of a little online training thing, yeah. a video or some yeah. kind of. We do that. You know, we have core skills that we have to do every year. Um, things like safeguarding. So doctors aren't allowed to practice unless they are have their safeguarding um, qual- um, quality like assurance. CPD or, or CPD. It's CPD, yeah. yeah. That, and, and you do these things online. It's very, very useful stuff. It doesn't take a lot of time. But you do get reminded of those key signs of that person is at risk and this is what you do when you see that person is is at risk or potentially at risk do the same for yourself and for your and for your team that's quite interesting isn't it because you could potentially have the role of the state um in driving entrepreneurship which we had a previous interview that said how useful um, the swedish government was in in moving forward technology scene in sweden Mm. the cpd is presumably a government authorized uh, you know accreditations that you need to keep resitting and similarly with wellness and diversity is like if, if you can have these as a sort of an official mandate it's like 
set up with HMRC and we suggest you go through these professional, you know, whatever updates it might be, yeah. that eventually it just becomes part of the dialogue. Um, entrepreneurs are very good at talking and sharing information with each other on what's working and not working for them. Do you think there's the ability for for people who take this seriously to not have to trade that off against increased wages? Because in theory, if you're going to pay £32,000 at a company that has no concern for your health, that's £30,000 for one that really does take it seriously. Um, I think more people would say the second one was the, the better place to go. I, I personally think people will be happier taking a little bit less pay, being in an environment that genuinely creates a better quality of life. Rome is a great example. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, I don't know, who was it that was telling me this? A really brilliant entrepreneur called Rick. Ricardo Sabatini. Um, he was the chief data officer at the Human Longevity Inc., quantum physicist, very interesting bloke, now doing stuff in life sciences in Boston. And uh, he was telling me that Rome is very interesting because y- you only have to pay the very top software engineers in Rome about 80 grand a year, euros, um, m- because the quality of life in Rome actually has been valued. Right. It's been valued at a, at a hundred thousand a year, so you're actually getting a hundred and eighty thousand package just by living in Rome. Ah. So I, I think this is quite intriguing. <laughs> so, so if your environment, if your company's environment is really superb, it, people will do things for the ability to, you know, for instance, one of the things which is very good is to actually have a formal working week, as in. A, a working week with your team of four days a week and the and the other day a week is uh, for either for excess um, or for your own professional development or for holidays or whatever it is and people get shocked oh my god you know it's going to be 20% less work turns out it's not it's actually you get net net more output mm. Plus, you get all the added benefits of people having done, you know, additive things like learned a new skill or, um, you know, been to a particular event that's ended up winning a new contract or a new, made, made a new partnership for the business. So, so there, there are some things which are really interesting new initiatives that might not work for every industry, but they can be explored. Well, we run a four and a half day week, but of a sort of semi-professional day, which, as you say, is that gap between what you value professional development and some kind of integration to your workplace yeah. applications because uh, otherwise you turn your back on it weekend comes and you, you won't think about work at all whereas actually I find that there's a spirit of generosity towards people who treat you with yeah. that same respect I, f- I find that we've made being well sound simple um, when when in fact like you can have read like you know, genius foods and why we sleep and you can do mind you can have a mindfulness app and yet still feel like you're wandering in the dark um when it comes to your own wellness so let alone the other people around you and so like is it then reasonable to expect founders to you know do an online training course and be able to you know prescribe not prescribe but um create I th- a culture of I, I i don't think it i don't think it's just something that can be generated from a single watching of a of a little online training course. Mm. This is an ongoing thing. Um, I definitely think having check-ins with folk like coaches like us, like the, the kind of folk that check in uh, on a routine basis, on a regular basis, monthly, quarterly, uh, in a bit of a deeper dive with, with our CEO, uh, founder CEOs, um, It's you have to have a regular kind of check in mm. and to regroup and to think okay what's worked and what hasn't just as you would if you've failed in the release of a project or it's done a particular you know version 1.4 is done incredibly well and then you look at that and go why did that happen and and 1.5 failed miserably and look at you know that you have to build it in just as you would with a product release so you would with your human resource mm, release if you like yeah. <laughs> you know um i i it is not easy. I, I don't. I don't want to make it seem as if everything is super simple. It, it's not. But what I think is super simple is is to just accept the reality that you cannot continue to generate strong economies in today's era um, by getting people to just churn out hours mm. at any cost. Those days are over. Well, I think the, to, to the point about being lost as well, I think the absence of a baseline or a measurable baseline across an aggregate 
number of people such that it, it's statistically relevant has been causing the problem because you or I can eat a healthier diet for three months and anecdotally say I feel better but being able to continuously feed back to my baseline health or get checked in with a, with a clinic which is solely concerned with my optimization allows me to I guess see the 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 results of that because I what I find disheartening is when I sort of set off on a course of action and it's utterly unclear to me whether I feel better because some days I'm just working harder or sometimes you will feel I don't know, there'd be family stress that you can't account for. So it's it, it'd be interesting to kind of look inside myself more. And I think that's what's so exciting about, you know, healthcare and entrepreneurship at the moment is this is just such a wide open space. I mean, where do you sit with our, you know, ability to get DNA tested and do you value Very those deep, services? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then to some people who get, you know, blood tests from thrive like how do we piece this together is this puzzle that can i don't know if i don't know if doing blood testing on your staff is relevant really um there's some fundamental hygiene things that we need to do for all of us and one of those things as i said at the very beginning is to realize that your greatest asset in your organization is your people Mm. and you have to care for each other and i really mean that and that's that means also caring for yourself um, and I think that that bit, as I said, is the easy bit, the realization that that's important. We spent many years drumming that into people, and I think we've gotten there. The next stage is kind of then what do you do about it? And a bunch of people that whose investors um, also um, care for them and a bunch of people who care for each other uh, and know that being well will also result in a better company will figure it out providing they keep a cadence. You're talking about bright people Mm. who are going to collect or assess themselves, to collect data or assess themselves in some way, and they're going to figure it out. That's fine. We'll work it out. You're not going to get... Product one is not going to be as good as product two or product three. Same thing, yeah? So that's all right. As long as you get started, as long as you know it's important, as long as you get started, as long as you have a regular cadence, I think we're okay. As far as going sort of super deep as an individual is concerned, you know, do you want to actually find out if you've got a genetic predisposition to being to be a kick ass more or not sleep as much? Do you want to do thrive of blood tests where you work out your hormones? Dude, there are geeks and there are non-geeks. Mm. Yeah, go, go as far as you like. You know, that's a different matter. That's more about an individual really trying to figure out whether something that's not quite working for them or some goal that really is about massively detailed incremental gains um, there is now yeah direct access to labs and tests and all sorts of uh, intelligence out there for you to figure it out whilst before you'd have to be a lab mouse Mm. And what does this say for the individual who comes into an organization of the future and let's say he's somebody who spent a lot of time in his computer science degree um, didn't play any sport at school but is is anxious about maybe this requirement to be healthier or more fit or capable like do we have a cultural shift where I don't know if people want to be necessarily forced into being fitter but being more well right yeah and and you try being more well if you don't see the sun if you don't go for a walk, if if you've worked 120 hours, mm. um, now you know there are there are some inc- uh, person who I've got enormous respect for. I don't know him very well, but I know his work ethic. Is Demis Harabis, um, and his absolute mission in life is to, you know, figure out intelligence, deep mind. You know, the founder of Deep Mind, and he and he will work harder than like uh, seems like anyone else that I know um, to be able to achieve that goal, and in so doing, he he thrives and he th- flourishes and I don't know if he's an elite athlete but I don't know if somebody could find the time to be an elite athlete and do what he does mm. but at the same time he doesn't compromise his team mm. Mm. so it's you know there, there are different people that want to achieve different things through different areas of their of their life to to be able to flourish um, but, but I, I, I think I think having having an awareness of how your work ethic affects others is is the most important thing to synchronize on versus that we all have to be running every day <laughs> well and dare i say when you are aligned with um something meaningful or a mission which it seems more startups are trying to achieve there's a lot more um emphasis on impact um i imagine that probably reduces your stress levels associated with the task you're completing so let's say it was deep mind and you think that the work here is so meaningful that i find it completely fulfilling oh yeah the, the stress is channeled in in a way that doesn't seem like i'm 
I'm doing something meaningless. Yeah, and... it's it's so, so stress is work over area, right? Okay, work is not stress. Okay, so so if you your stress, it literally, I'm talking about the physics of stress. If you've got a you know, if you've got something that you're, let's say, a an old one of those old plastic rulers. <laughs> If you've got an old plastic ruler and you're and you know you're 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 bending it, if it's over a wide area, it'll only bend a tiny bit. If you're putting the f- same force over a small area, it'll snap. And so, if your work is really, really, it, there's a lot of it, but it's incredibly rewarding and it's spread out over enough people over enough time, it's actually not stressful. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, that, that's the other thing is to not be afraid of hard work. Be afraid, be afraid of, be afraid of stress because that means that that hard work has not been shared amongst enough people over mm-hmm. enough time. Um, but certainly, work that gives you a sense of meaning and purpose. It, it's almost like a self anesthetic. It doesn't matter how much it is. You seem to just love it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then that that's I think the the sweet spot. The best companies in the world will also realize that even if it's amazing work, l- like the direct effect of being able to stop people perhaps from dying quite as often if they roll into an A and E department. That was my world for a long time. There can be nothing as for me. There could be nothing as fulfilling. And I didn't mind staying up till four o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning doing that. But also knowing, or, and this is the, where the real trick is, when to stop, when to pull back, when not to break. Um, and, and that's where you really go from doing great work to doing extraordinary things. Mm. So we'd like to end by doing um, a very a quick, quick fire series. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is for that reading list you mentioned earlier, maybe the top three books on your um, human performance reading list. Yep, Genius Foods by Dr. Paul Grewal. Mm-hmm. How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, mm-hmm. and Why We Sleep by Matt Walker. Okay, okay. And what about a prediction for the future? Uh, by twenty twenty five, there will not be a single company that doesn't put the wellness of its people on par with its commercial success. And finally, we didn't really talk about this, we wanted to, um, is the role that we obviously talk about athletes and performance enhancers, um, but whether there's a, is it an equivalent in the entrepreneurial space? Um, for instance, uh, microdosing has been talked about in Silicon Valley. Do you think there's a role for, for any of that? We certainly, human beings are not what they are uh, without a certain degree of hacking. Even cooking food is a hack. Mm. And I'm in absolutely no doubt that there will be more and more hacks available uh, to help us cope with the kinds of things that are kind of not normal to um, us, such as uh, traveling across time zones, which we were not evolved to do. Um, so I, I have no doubt that, you know, just as caffeine is a hack, maybe nootropics will, will take a, a, a serious prescription role uh, as a safer way of, uh, of maybe resynchronizing body clocks, that serotonin agonists might help us rewire our minds. Um, I'm not telling everyone to go out to the fields and start growing mushrooms, but you'll see an awful lot more of um, things that both help us resynchronize and regenerate our bodies in a world where, that isn't frankly 100% natural. Okay. And finally, the best advice you've ever received? Protect your sleep. Protect your sleep. Okay. I feel like there's about a million more questions that yeah. I'd like to ask. We're sorry, we're aware of your time. Um, but the last thing we'd like to ask is if there's anybody listening who um, can do anything to help you on your amazing journey forward, um, what would that be? Any entrepreneurs, anyone interested in making sure that they and their companies want to flourish, get some get some feedback from them on what is the biggest stresses in their life, what are what are the things that they are most concerned about about the wellness in their companies, and just feed it feed it through. Um, if we are going to do things like well-founded we're going to design it right and then we we need to know from the entrepreneurs themselves what's what's affected them the most what's worked the best where should they feed that information to i am sure there are more than more than one ways of catching me on twitter or okay. linkedin or, or otherwise okay. yeah
Well, thank you very much for your time, Judge. You're, really very, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. <laughs>